I was talking to some folks at, um, at, you know, within Flow Foundation about opportunities to speak at this event, um, and they said that um, I had a, had a chance to talk to Juan, and uh, you know, obviously we met that time back in 2018, but we've met on multiple occasions since then. Um, and um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about computation and scaling, um, because I think we have some really interesting ideas in, in Flow, but he and I haven't talked since Filecoin launched the FBM, uh, their execution environment, and so I thought it would be interesting to you know, update y'all and, and, and maybe uh, answer some of his questions about how Flow does computation. And then at the same time for me to learn, and hopefully some of you, to learn a little bit about what Filecoin does on the computation side, because I think it's very well known for its storage chops. Um, but I think the computation up is newer. And uh, so yeah, so why don't we start there and talk a little bit about FVM? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, FVM is a, the VM execution layer for Filecoin. And the way that we architected FVM is to create a hypervisor structure where um, we decoupled the kind of like initial VM engine. Um, you know, a lot of the other crypto networks are, you know, have either use EVM directly or create a, another competitive VM or something like that. And our position in the broad Falcon community has been that um, at the end of the day, Web3 uh, has to make, has to create things that make sense um, from the perspective of the laws of physics. And the cloud computing uh, world has followed kind of what makes sense in terms of physics for quite a while. Um, and so a lot of the solutions found by the cloud computing environment are gonna make a lot of sense in the crypto space, uh, in the Web3 space. And there's been kind of a hurdle of that translation happening into, into the space for a bunch of reasons. Um, and so from my perspective, there will be large numbers of communities that care about their um, smart contract language and their specific VM and, and so on. And one very good way of like supporting all of those communities is to create a hypervisor and virtualize each of the VMs on top. So the FVM brings um, this kind of WASM-based uh, execution engine with where you can mount other VMs on top. And the idea there is like, don't argue about whether to use Solidity or something else, use whatever you want um, and be able to interop across um, these execution engines uh, from our perspective also, WASM is very much the, the future in terms of massive parts of industries are rewriting their entire stacks into WASM-oriented um, systems. And so blockchains need to kind of evolve into that model. Now EVM and Solidity have a massive network effect for great reason. There's an enormous amount of development that has gone into that. Um, and so we should like not you know, try to create something separate that like, doesn't interop and instead just get the stronger WASM foundations underneath EVM. Um, and so that's kind of like the idea of FVM. Uh, Filecoin needs a computation engine to be able to do just coordination structures around the storage network itself. Um, we, it was a long-standing goal to bring um, a VM capabilities into the Filecoin blockchain. Um, we just didn't start with it for a bunch of you know, path-dependent um, implementation reasons. And the kind of like longer term goal set is to create a structure where you can bring computation close to where the data is, right? So data is very expensive to move around. Um, you know, the, over time storage densities are gonna get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, computing uh, costs and the density of, of um, uh, computer like air volume is gonna keep uh, growing. And so, the hardest and most expensive thing to deal with will be moving data from one location to another. This is why you're getting like these massive scale um, AI clouds now that are you know, highly localized in a specific spot and it's very difficult to move around um, the data and the models and whatnot. Funny story, like this actually goes back to like the mid 20th century where people calculated, well, based on speed of light and computing and, and improvement, um, they're likely make sense for like five or six computers. And what they really meant is like five or six regions in the world that would have extremely dense computing. Um, and when you look at the data center scale today, it's like, you know, you, if you squint at it, it's maybe off by a, an order of magnitude, but like there's not, you know, 5,000 um, data centers. There's, you know, closer to, closer to 100. Um, you know, in terms of like really massive scale, where, where it makes sense to put massive scale computing environments. So um, the Falcon network is gonna bring a bunch of the data together. Once the data is there, um, you want to bring the computation to the data, run the computation close to the data, and produce more data there. Um, that data really has gravity. In a sense, it, um, it, it has both in like the figurative sense of 
once you accumulate a lot of data, you want to generate more data nearby it. But also in the actual physics perspective, like it requires atoms to be arranged in a particular way to represent data. So when, when you are actually storing or creating data, you are using up more atoms and that generates like, it, like an actual physical energy cost of moving around that information somewhere else. Um, so you, you always wanna be on the right side of physics. Like you, you do, should not do things that are like counter to physics. Um, and bringing it back into like more blockchain native things, um, the current consensus mechanics of the entire industry are doing things that don't really make sense from the physics perspective. They're like, you, you're con we're contorting the way in which um, to achieve verifiability to try and get this like global earth level settlement. And so that's why we're forced to have, you know, pretty slow confirmation times. Um, and we also want this kind of high availability environment, which is we want longest chain sort of protocols. And so we end up with like super slow confirmation times. We now are adding, you know, L2s and L3s and whatnot. Um, and if you kind of like stack these, you, you end up like increasing the, the slowness of these systems. So instead, we need to move, be moving to architectures that um, really align with what physics tells us we should be doing, which means that you want to settle transactions as close in physical distance as you can. Meaning if you have an enormous volume of transactions happening in a particular region of space, you want the settlement to be bounded by the speed of light between all of the interactions of those parties and not introduce arbitrary delays that interconnect that group to some other, place, uh, other party. Practically what that means is that we should have, be having very high frequency um, <clears throat> settlement of things locally and be bucketing the participants in, a, in particular regions. The way that the cloud does it today is actually maps onto that, right? Like there's a bunch of data centers around the world, there's, they have a bunch of regions that makes sense from a physics perspective. We wanna have that same kind of structure in the crypto space and we need to move into architectures that leverage that. You know, if you wanna have an MMO in the blockchain space or if you wanna have like massive scale markets, like, you know, energy markets at, at scale, you need that stuff to be partition tolerant. You need that stuff to not go down if you can't talk to some random blockchain node somewhere else in the world. And you need that stuff to be able to settle like locally in milliseconds to seconds, not, you know, to you know, tens to hundreds of milliseconds, not multiple seconds or minutes, right? And so like the entire block, blockchain world needs to achieve these guarantees um, before we'll have massive scale adoption uh, by the real like industries of the world. Sorry, I just like, uh, it was a huge diatribe, but. Uh, so yeah, that's why, that's why we built the FEM the way we did. Uh, so presumably FEM uh, computations can, uh, can process data stored in Filecoin, um, but not all nodes have all data. So when I submit a computation, how do you bring the data and the computation? Yeah, sorry, actually, so, so FEM runs a computation on the chain, so, so there is like the data plane and then there's the kind of like control plane of the chain. FVM is still processing stuff on chain, and we have a way of um, in showing um, data from the from the actual data plane of Filecoin and surfacing it on the chain. And but that computation is still happening on the chain. The way we want to scale for the computation to happen locally on the data outside of the chain um, is through what we call computer over data networks. Meaning, um, we, there needs to be um, com networks that are designed specifically to run certain kinds of programs at scale and in high performance. And those networks are the ones that need to be like operating on all the data. Meaning the current blockchain structure of having you know, a super um, expensive single VM that everybody runs um, is not the right way to do high performance computing. Right? If you wanna do high performance computing, you want as few computers to run that as possible. You want to um, trade off between verifiability and privacy to meet the needs of your application. And you want to orchestrate that computation through a kind of like job scheduler, not through you know, invocations in a, in a blockchain transaction processing system. So it's like fundamentally a different paradigm for how you want to do job processing. Um, and so the way, we, the, the way to like think of um, the structure is that you would have maybe like the Falcon L1 as, um, as like an orchestrator of these computer over data networks. Um, and the computer over data networks are, um, need to be localized to where the data is, meaning you want a structure where you're able to assign compute jobs and run them 
locally in a particular region and not be dealing with like speed of light delays to the, to the other side of the world and ideally be able to do that as close as possible to the data. So that means, um, you know, think of like those as, you know, L2 networks that are partition tolerant, like their own, they have their own chain, um, they're settling um, to 5.0 cell ones, but they have their own chain um, uh, operation, uh, likely partitioned by, by region, um, and you're running, running the jobs directly from, you're orchestrating the jobs with FEM, you're not running the jobs with an FEM, if that makes sense. Like FEM, I'm not saying that FEM couldn't be extended to actually run the jobs, that's possible, but that's, that's not what FEM is today. Um, so is it more about facilitating what might be called L2s in other ecosystems? Yeah, that's right. Um, so there's already um, a set of L2s growing in the Falcon ecosystem. Okay, cool. But the way that we think about that is not L2 rollups. Like you can totally do the standard L2 rollup structure from Ethereum and map it straight to Falcon. Like that, a set of parties are doing that. Um, the structure that we find more interesting and valuable is to create a network structure where you can have partition tolerant environments. Meaning when you create an L2, that L2 should be a separate chain with its own data availability. You should checkpoint into the parent um, and you should bootstrap the security base on the parent, um, but you should be able to exploit something better than the constraints of the parent. You shouldn't just have another L1 and just increase the bandwidth a little bit. You should be able to go dramatically faster, meaning like you should localize that somewhere. Sequencers kind of do this. Like if you squint at sequencers, they're sort of doing this, but it's sort of unbundled with the data availability layers and whatnot in a way that I think it's still like very tied to L1s. It's not really partition tolerant. Um, you want to be, th think of like a, like, a, like a mission critical application, like an energy market or dispatch for like, you know, a ride sharing service or, um, or even an MMO. Like you want all of those operations to not fall over if some computer in, somewhere else in the world fails or some cable in the, rest, in the internet fails. You need to be fully partition tolerant. And until we achieve that, like, we're kind of just playing at computing. It's not real computing yet. Um, that's my you know, hot take. <laughs> but you still have, I, I assume, uh, like an, an atomic core, right? That, the, that coordination layer that is a, a synchronization point for when, when there does need to be sort of, I guess what I would call cross shade communication, cross shard rather, communication. Yeah, totally. So, so the way, so one ap approach to this, and this is the approach that um, I've been working on for a while and a number of us have been working on towards, is um, think of like a fractal structure for blockchains where you have, you know, your L1 is really an earth level consensus that really deals with speed of light around the world and you, you know, settle in seconds, um, you know, multiple seconds to a, a minute depending on your level of security. Um, but then you want to derive from that subnets that are able to be localized. And so that layer of L2s, think of that as a region. So instead of being a network that operates across the entire world, think of that being bounded and connected to a specific region of the world. So, you know, like US West or like, you know, um, Singapore or whatever. Um, and in that, when you do that, you can localize the participation of nodes in that region and then you speed up the consensus dramatically. Meaning you no longer need to wait multiple seconds to settle. You can settle in tens of milliseconds to 100 milliseconds if you want. And at that point, that's when you start hitting the, the time required for an energy market or the time required for an MMO or an FPS. Um, if you need like further scalability and bandwidth there, then you can like derive a layer of L3s. But you want that entire structure, yes, to settle to the L1 when you need to do inter-chain commerce in a sense, but you, don't, you should be able to completely settle transactions locally. Uh, and so th this is about state partitioning, not about blending all the state together. Right? So the current trajectory of um, of L2s in the broad blockchain space is to kind of treat the whole state together and you do in, in one single L1. And the L2s are just a way of like speeding up some of the computation while still dealing with the same state. Like you're still doing transactions across the same state. What I'm describing really partitions the state so that you can do, so you can do finality and settlement in a subset. But I think there's gotta be different levels of finality, right? Like if a, if a local partition is going to produce results that are trusted by another local partition, then in a sense, you can't really say that that's final until it is on the, the base chain, right? It depends on what you mean by finality here. So what you, you might be able to, the other shards might be able to speculate that something has been settled. You just don't know what it is yet. You find out what it is once it settles to the, to the parent. And, and that's the same thing as like, if you're in an MMO and you like are playing a game or whatever, and like something happens, um, 
you do have to deal with speed of light delays until like another party somewhere else or like in another server finds out about it. Um, uh, but, but you're not kind of like trying to uh, settle across with extremely high security guarantees uh, like in the entire world. My, the, the basic claim is like there's a lot of applications that need to run and, set and achieve finality in tens of milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. And we have to design against that, not try and like force everything to have multi-second delays. Yeah, I'm, I'm researching right now. I'm working with some folks researching right now what um, what a, a like a what would be called an L2. But I, I don't really want to call it an L2 either. I see you're like you, you want to, You're tempted to use that term because people are familiar with it. But it's also like I think there's there's a better model than L2. Um, and so when in our research, we're, we're looking at a lot of um, uh, taking a lot of inspiration from state channels. Um, so if people don't know uh, state channels very well. You can almost think of state channel as a temporary L2, an ad hoc L2, where um, you know typically state channels as have been implemented today, uh, it's two parties. Um, they'll create a, a little state space for themselves, and then they can compute back and forth as fast as they can uh, can communicate. Um, that's actually a well understood technology, well um, uh, researched, lots of academic papers on it. But obviously, you hear those limitations, right? It's two people. Um, engaging in interactions, and as soon as you start to add additional people, um, all of those mechanisms start to fall down. And then, obviously, we have L2s, which are um, which are inherently multi-user. Um, um, but the the way L2s structure right now is is that there's sort of no concept of a temporary L2. You sort of start an L2 and then you keep going. And I think that there's you know the the research I'm looking into right now is the idea of blurring the lines between those and saying, can we make something that at small scales looks a lot like a state channel where you can just create it at a drop of a hat and shut it down with, with very little um, uh, uh, very, very little fanfare um, and get all of the security of, of a state channel, um, but actually have multiple participants, have people being able to be added and removed, have that thing go on for um, uh, multiple time periods, and, and potentially even outsource um, you know, specific transactions to the base chain um, to do the things that only the base chain understands, right? So um, maybe there's a DEX on the base chain that you want to trade against because it's got the largest liquidity pool. And so making sure that all of those things are accessible from um, these, uh, I guess, local clusters or app-specific clusters. Um, and so I think it's, I, I agree with you, it's, it's a really important point that people understand that, um, that we need a secure and solid L1. We need to be able to settle to that. And there probably should just be in any single ecosystem like a, a canonical place where that we all ladder up to, right? You, you talked about the fractal system. I assume that that's a tree with a, a single root. Um, and so ha then, then the techniques of how you branch out from that, um, I think, is still, is still yet to be determined. I don't think there's a clear answer to that. So um, yeah, I think we, we agree on a, uh, on a lot of things here. The, the, we, we do use the term uh, ones and L2s and so on, but in our perspective, um, we sort of like map the current L1 paradigm to an earth level consensus, and we really think of L2s should be either application specific or, um, or like you're trying to just do increase span out on the L1, or you're really going into regions. There, there are different reasons why you do an L2, um, but in our perspective, um, we, we try and kind of orient towards state separation there as opposed to just treating them as just roll ups. Um, however, like I, I want to like think bigger here. So Earth level consensus isn't the whole internet, um, and this suggests really an L zero, like what, meaning you need to be able to settle across larger spaces. And so the fractal goes all the way down, but like also goes up. You need to be able to add layers above. Um, and so if you um, in, in the IPFS community, we came up with a principle called the interplanetary principle, which is that if your distributed system if your design for a distributed system wouldn't be tolerable for humans trying to interrupt across planetary distances, meaning a person in Earth trying to interact with a person in Mars, then your design is wrong. Um, and so a concrete example of this is like, think about the current web. If you take the current web server architecture and the way that most web apps are built and just deploy it across Earth and Mars and you try to get people to like interact with Slack or things like that, then you would deal with like, you know, minute long, four to eight minute delays, depending on where Mars is, um, with, relative to, to Earth. 
before you can see like page loads or before you get back like specific um, objects or whatever. Like that's just not workable. Uh, instead, what you want to do is to like understand the the scale difference and then design a system that operates well. Meaning, if you have to do a round trip across that distance, you want to ideally do that in background. Ideally, do it ahead of time before the user needs the data, and you want to be operating much more in a push model where you're like replicating a lot of the data somewhere and then doing local um, operations, to make it really fast. Right? This is the foundation principle behind IPFS. Um, and you're like, okay, well, Mars Earth that seems like you know um, irrelevant because like we we don't have a lot of humans on Mars yet. But no, the the point is like when you think about a mobile phone and a data center. The, the difference in computing latency between a chip inside of a data center and a chip in your hands in a mobile phone and the bandwidth of like moving through the entire internet between those two, that distance is larger. Like the relative compute speed distances are larger than the Earth Mars distance, right? So w w if you want to operate in like nanoseconds to microseconds inside of a chip, why pay second oriented delays to go around the world? Like that, that's a, like many orders of magnitude. And so the interplanetary principle, if you design against that, then it very neatly translates to how data, sense, data centers work, how our computers work, how our phones work. And so from that, like we, from that same principle, we came up with a project called interplanetary consensus, which is like, how would you do this whole blockchain con consensus type thing in the interplanetary setting, um, and then just use that as a thinking tool to force you to design the right thing and then bring it down to the world. Meaning, if you really think of like an Earth-Mars commerce setup, you would want a chain on Earth, you would want a chain on Mars, and then you would want a separate thing that settles between them. And you certainly don't want to wait, you know, multiple hours to settle something to Mars and back, right? And so like that, that's just like crazy. Like nobody would like want to want to do that system. Um, certainly, you need to move value slowly between those two places. But once some of the value is in Earth, you want to transact it in Earth very quickly. And if value is in Mars, you want to transact there. Same thing with the data centers. If some value is in, in, U, in US West, you want to transact locally. If some value is in Singapore, you want to transact locally. And it's only when you move between those two that you want to then incur the higher latency costs. And so that's like interplanetary consensus and like the, the kind of basis for, for that kind of like fractal pattern. But it also goes back up, meaning like we should eventually, once we start having you know, the inter space internet and so on, do settlement, and not just settlement, but like you know, this so software supply chain is one, a problem that really matters in space. Where like which software package are you getting? Where is it from? What are the signatures? What are the updates? All of that information. That's like a real concrete problem that a bunch of groups and companies and nation states are like dealing with today. Like that's the the problem space. And there you do not want to pay like these huge costs going all the way back to back to Earth. Um, you want to be able to have all of that information in a hash chain locally. And, that, and that's where, where this kind of model comes in. Cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of use cases have, have been picked up most? Like, what are, what are the trends you're seeing in FDM uh, adoption? Right now, there's a network called Fluence um, that is like the first L2 on Falcon. First, it's a compute network that is doing, um, it's kind of like assembling a, a large network of compute nodes um, to do a bunch of um, different kinds of jobs. And they have like this kind of job spec oriented structure and be able to like, um, run a lot of operations. I think that's like a super exciting use case. We're finally getting you know, computer over data um, networks. Um, there's a whole range of these computer over data networks that are um, building that kind of um, that kind of structure. Um, I'm really excited about like this isn't like um, what I'm really excited about in terms of the consensus stuff that I'm describing is like finally being able to do you know proper games um, in blockchains, meaning make an FPS, make an MMO, and have all of the operations actually settling like on chain. Like all like when when I say put an FPS on chain, people are like, that's crazy. Like that'll never happen. And like, no, 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 like that's really what we mean, what we mean. Like force ourselves as an industry to to create the right underlying software primitives to support that use case. And if we can do that well, that applies to just so many other super valuable use cases. Um, and so I use that as a kind of like a foil of saying, like, let's show this working um, and then kind of scale it out from there. Yeah, I, I use the same example of like using a real time game. Um, you know, for, for me, I'm thinking it through the lens of state channels, but the same thing, right? Where you have the security of the blockchain and any, you know, issues that come up, any, any disagreements in, in the, the results or whatnot can, can go right back to the chain and, and, and be settled that way. 
And, and people are genuinely shocked that, that these techniques can actually scale to you know, real-time interactions. And, um, and I, I really look forward to that. Um, I think we're just about done time. Is there any questions you have for me or maybe questions yeah, for anybody I, else? I'm curious how you like, um, think about the space evolving. Like you had a, you, you've seen a ton of different application scales. You made some of the first games in the entire industry. You have also worked on like you know, a, a wide range of other applications. Um, what do you think is like the next two to three years? Um, what, what do the next two or three years hold in terms of like like starting to prove things out that weren't working, you know, a year ago or two years ago or something like that. Like, um, Web3 has been now operating for quite a while and like we haven't yet hit like the billion user mark. We're in like the 100 million user, which is great, but like we really need to get to like billions of users um, scale. And so like what are the things that like you're excited about over the next two or three years? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a weird kind of chicken and egg problem, I feel like, because, uh, you know, I think that many users of Web3 today, they're quite happy with what the blockchains can do. And so they aren't look, looking to push the boundaries and create new kinds of applications and whatnot. Now, obviously those people exist. I love those people um, and, uh, and I try and get a chance to interact with those people as often as I can. But, you know, to bring more people into the industry, that's just the only way, right? Like the, by now everyone knows, or at least has a broad sense of what DeFi and, and like, kinds of like financial things that blockchains can do. And, and you could argue, right, from CryptoKitties on, like my whole time in crypto has been like, how can we do more with this technology than just financialization? Um, and I think that's gonna be a tough nut to crack because um, when, you know, when you have a chance of, of making millions of dollars posting a meme coin, um, it's hard to get somebody to, to, to go to that same person and say, hey, why don't you put a lot of effort into building something that no one's ever seen before um, that might not work, you know what I mean? Like, and so when it's so low effort to, to, to mimic what other people are doing, but you know, we see these cycles and you know, whether it's NFTs and everybody copies NFTs or whether it's meme coins and everyone copies meme coins, um, you know, what ends up lasting, right? From, you know, from, from DeFi to, you know, true collector uh, uh, communities using NFTs is the things that create lasting value that isn't monetary, right? Value, human value. Um, and so um, I, I think we need to see more people, one, waking up to understand how capable these systems are and that we can do more than the financial operations of add and subtract. We can do multiply, divide, um, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, but, but also then to, you know, have the courage to, um, to try something fundamentally new um, and, uh, and really, you know, take that next step into uh, you know, in, into the, the greater capabilities that are possible. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.